Review number four. For this, you are gonna be getting a formula chart. Looks like this, this is provided for you for the review. It'll also be provided for you on the test. This one will cover you for sections 4B, 4C, and 4D. The income tax part, that has a table that will also be provided, and we'll look at that a little bit later, but it doesn't have any formulas on it. Uh, what I thought I would do here at the beginning was look at the formulas and talk a little bit about what you're trying to identify in the problems so that you know which ones to be using. In section 4B, the types of problems that we had all involved a single payment of sorts. So most of the questions were about depositing or investing money into account. And what you did in that case is you put money into an account someday, and then it just sits there for X number of years. And at the end of it, you calculate how much interest has been earned and then what the total balance would be. But you're not making any extra payments or taking money out in that time. You just deposit it once and you let it do its thing. We can do the same thing with loans. You could take out a loan and then you don't make any payments but at the very end of your loan, you just pay back everything, including the interest. Okay, so the formulas that we use for that are gonna be the top three that are here. Now, as just being upfront, we're not gonna be using the continuous compounding one. This is a formula that goes along with this stuff, but I don't actually have that on the test. Don't stress about knowing how to do this one and um, remembering like where the E button was or those things. So it's really gonna be these two. And how do you decide between these? It either has the word simple or it's got the word compounds. That's it. So you're really looking for those words. Well, you're looking first for a situation that you're only depositing the money one time or you're only paying it back one time. And once you identify that, then you look to see if it has the word simple or if it has the word compound and that's what you'll be using. Now, if you come to another problem that uh, talks about oh, payments that are monthly, that's gonna get you into these other things that are here. These two are about savings. So if you're saving money up, and you should get this from the context of the problem, if you're saving money up, and it talks about making payments every month or deposits every month, then you wanna be using one of these two formulas. Now, these two are basically the same formula. We've talked about that in class, and you should see that the fractional parts are really just each other's reciprocals. The first, though, says that if you have the payment amount, you can figure out the accumulated value of the account at whatever number of years. The other one says that if you have a goal in mind of how much you wanna save, so the accumulated amount, you can calculate the amount that each payment needs to be. All right, now the other two formulas that we see at the bottom here, these will be if they're loans, and everything is pretty much the same as I described it before. Either you're looking for the payment that you need to make every month for your loan, or you're taking a payment that you can afford and figuring out how much you can actually borrow. Okay, but this is also the monthly payments, but this would be for a loan. Okay, and last, when you come to the questions that ask you about total return or annual return, you're just gonna be using these formulas. I mean, the names of the formulas will be the question. So you're looking for that. All right, so problems one and two are gonna be about the single deposits or the single payback of a loan problem. So that's gonna be your simple and your compound interest type problems. In problem one, you've actually got two parts. And what we wanna do in these two parts is get a better understanding or at least remember, our, um, uh, remember the difference that there is between simple interest and compound interest. Uh, so the prompt is the same for both of them. Um, we have Ariel who's going to deposit $5,000 into an account that earns 3% annual. So that's your APR, 3% annual. And in part A, um, she's going to leave that money in the account for four years with simple interest. Okay, so what you'd want to do is use this formula. Here, your principal is going to be the $5,000, which is also going to go here. Your rate is going to be 0 0.03 and the time is going to be the four years that it's at. So you really just plug in the numbers and then you, you calculate it. Here it is worked out. The one thing that I did want to identify about this, so we have, a, I guess, a little review of what simple interest really does. There's a part in here where your principal, the 5,000, gets multiplied by the rate 0 0.03 to 3% and you end up getting 150. What that number represents is the interest that is earned every year on $5,000 when you have a 3% interest rate. 
Okay, so then if you carry the loan out for four years or, um, actually this isn't a loan, she's depositing money, but if I mix up loan and deposits, don't worry about that stuff as I go through it. Okay, so if she deposits the $5,000, then she's gonna get $150 for every year that it's in there. And that's what simple interest is about, is about getting the same interest for every year that it's sitting there. So you multiply the 150 by four, add it all up and you can get uh, $5,600. So she made um, $600 in interest. Okay, when we look at compound interest, the whole idea is interest on interest. Okay, that first year, she is gonna make $150 in interest. But the second year, she's gonna get a little bit more interest because that 150 that she had earned through the first year is also gonna accumulate interest, interest on interest. Okay, uh, so here's what the formula is gonna look like when it's filled in, and it looks a little bit simpler than what we see here for the compound interest. And that's because the end value in this problem is a one. Um, it, it says here that it's gonna be annual compound interest. And you don't see too often the annual compound interest is usually like quarterly or um, daily or something different like that one. But the point of this question was to really get it to compare to part A simple interest. So we're still doing four years and we're gonna do um, the interest account calculated every year, but it'll be in compounding. So the end value ends up being one. And if you were to put a one in for the end, then you really just got your Y as the four you don't need to divide your APR by anything, so there's no reason to show it. So it ends up just looking like this. Um, you do need to add the one and the percentage first, complete the parentheses, then you can raise it to the power. Once you do that, you get approximately this number. This is probably rounded off a little bit. I'm gonna go ahead and type that in because um, I don't remember all these things. And of course, when you add them up, you can just type it in as 1.03. Raise that to the fourth power and you get this. So I did end up rounding off after that five, which followed with a zero. Um, number of decimals that we take anywhere between four and six, just kind of depends on problem to problem. And as I go through this, if I notice anything to share with that, then I will. But generally speaking, the more decimals you have, the more accurate your answer is gonna be. Um, in this particular problem, you can actually just keep building from the answer if you want. So if you don't round it here, the very next step is gonna be multiplying by the 5,000. So you can just immediately multiply and that'll give you your most accurate answer. And that's probably what I actually did. I might've just wrote it down in the rounded form. If you want, um, do the whole calculation with that. You know, just do that multiplication, see how that compares. Okay, what we end up noticing in part A, it's uh, 5,600. Part B, it's gonna be $5,627.54. So you get an extra 27.54 because of the compounding of the interest on interest. Uh, a couple of notes here. I already mentioned this one. When you're rounding, it does affect the answer. So keep, more, keep as, as many decimals as you can and that helps out. And of course, we should expect a higher value when you're doing compounding. So in some questions, you can almost do like a ballpark figure on things. That'll apply also to uh, the savings plans and stuff like that. You can do somewhat ballpark figures, but be aware that anything that involves compounding, you're gonna have something actually higher to go along with it. All right, so question two, this is also gonna be the compounding interest. But for this, we did not do annual compounding because it's important that we see what we're supposed to do if we actually have an end value. So this one's gonna be compounding daily. Um, all right, so let me go ahead and read the question. Find the balance of an account where $4,000 is invested for 10 years with an APR 3% compounded daily. Okay, so remember that this has only been deposited one time. It doesn't talk about any monthly payments. So that's why we know that it's not gonna be one of the larger formulas that we have unless it's one of the first few. It also then says the word compounding. So putting those together, that tells us that we should be using this formula. Okay, and now that we know that, we just have to extract everything from the problem so we can get it in there. Um, $4,000 is your principal, your APR. So I gotta keep flipping for this. That's gonna be 3% again, so 0 0.03. It says that it's compounded daily. So how many days are there in a year? That's gonna be 365. So remember your end value is 
It's supposed to be the number of times that we compound within a period, okay? And for us, we're always basing it on a year, so the number of times we compound within a year. So if we say daily, that's 365. And I think it said we do this for 10 years. Yeah, so that'll be your Y value. All right, so here's everything filled in. And for this problem, what I wanted to do was at least show you um, if you can't type everything into your calculator at one time and get an answer like my calculator would actually allow me to do, these are the steps that you could go through for this problem and get the answer. What I would probably, like, so even though I numbered them with a one here and this is a three, you should take care of this either as mental math or just off to the side here, like 365 times 10 is 3,650. But go ahead and make sure you know what that product is so you don't have to write it or type it as two separate numbers. It's an easy thing to do. All right, so you could start, or you should start here. Not could, you should. That's where you need to start the problem if you're doing it in steps. We're gonna take that 3% and you're gonna divide it by 365. And when you divide something really small, like 0 0.03 by a large number, like six, uh, sorry, 365, you're gonna get back something really tiny. In fact, it's gonna come back as scientific notation. That's how tiny it is. But the good news is, as soon as you add the one, it's gonna take care of that scientific notation. So I'm building off of my last answer, it works nice. Turns out to be this. You're gonna notice that there's a whole bunch of zeros. Now, if you did have to round this off and use it for another part of the problem, which we're not doing here, you wanna go past all these zeros and try and collect maybe four more values. So I'd maybe go all the way out to the nine if I needed to like round this off on my own. But in this question, the way that the formula is designed, we can continue to build. So I'm gonna immediately raise that one that number to my power, which is 3,650. Just let it calculate. You'll notice it still comes back as a one point something, just a little bit larger. That will then multiply by the 4,000. And that is it. That's all you do. All right, for the next few problems, we're gonna be looking at the cases where you don't have a single deposit or you're not paying back a loan with a single payment, but instead doing maybe monthly installments for them. That means that we're gonna be using these formulas here. Um, so if it's a savings plan, you wanna be using one of these. If it's a loan, you're gonna be using one of those. All right, so number three says, your goal is to create a college fund for your child. Suppose that you find a fund that offers an APR of 5%. How much should you deposit monthly? It's right there. How much should you deposit monthly to accumulate $150,000 in 16 years? Okay, so for this, we're trying to save up money for a college fund. But this is kind of the giveaway here is that we want to deposit monthly. So this isn't a one-time thing that we're going to put into an account and then just let it run for 16 years and then it become this here we're gonna continuously be adding money into the account and we need to find out what that is. Okay, so from our, our formulas, this is not a loan. We're not trying to pay back for the college. We're doing this ahead of time. We're actually saving up. So that means it's one of these two formulas. Since our question is asking us to figure out the payment that we need per month, that means we're using this one. This calculates your payment given what your goal is in mind, the $150,000 and then, of course, you're going to be given the APR. You're going to be given your time frame. You'll be given these things here. You're only going to ever be asked about the payment or the accumulated value for our problems. So this is the one that we want to use. You're going to get everything filled in where it goes. Looks like that. And um, I'll let you just kind of compare and see where all the numbers went for that. Now, the rest of this is to make sure that you know how to evaluate it. If you have a calculator like I've got, you can literally type in everything at one time, press enter and great, you got the answer. If you don't have a calculator like this one, then you're gonna need to make sure that you can do these in the appropriate steps. So for this question, I'm gonna take you through what it would look like to do it step by step for pretty much any type of a calculator. Now there's some features that you must have on your calculator. You need to be able to do exponents as long as you can do that, what I'll show should work. It just might appear a little bit different on your screen. Maybe you have a caret symbol for your exponents. All right, this part right here, the APR over N is like the most critical piece to the problem at the beginning is really understand what we're getting from that. 
Sometimes your APR divides really nicely. Like if I had 6% and I divide that by 12, I get a really great number like 0 0.005 that I can just continue to use and there's no issues. Ours is different. We've got 5% divided by 12. And when you do this, you just get a decimal. That's just like, it, it goes on and on from here. So you have to make a judgment call on how much of that you're going to take, because at some point you are going to be rounding numbers and, um, and need to make that decision in these formulas. You can't get around it like we do in the compound interest formulas. Okay. So here's my decision, which tends to get pretty close to the answers. Whatever number zeros I have here, I kind of ignore that. And then I just start counting digits after that. And I like to take four of them. So I'm going to do four, one, six, and then that'll round up to a seven. Okay. So I'm not just doing four decimals, but I'm trying to take four, what we call significant digits, skipping over the zeros and get a little bit more. Of course, the general rule here would be, uh, make sure I write this down correct first. Uh, the general rule would be the more decimals you take, the better. If you want to write down all of them, then it's going to be as accurate as you could possibly go or get. Uh, this should get us pretty darn close. You don't need all the extra sixes for that one. All right, so remember that that's this number. It's also the same thing that's here. Now, 12 times 16, that's something that in a lot of the problems you actually see me do ahead of time and you won't even notice. Like you won't see the 12 and the 16, you actually just have the product. So I'll just keep that in mind. That's 192, okay? I'll just write it down because I'll forget. 192 for that part. Okay. Now that we got some of our numbers figured out, we're going to get back to this. Um, that fraction, which is this guy here, if you want, because I'm now really going to start the calculation with this. If you want, you could just type that in and you leave all of those numbers and we're going to build off of it. It's when we get to here that we're going to need to do some rounding. So I'm going to go back and pull that up again. Um, that's not what I wanted to do. There you go. Okay, so I have that with all the decimals. The next step, hopefully you're not getting a glare there, it's hard for me to tell. The next step that we're gonna do is add a one. Okay, so I've got all the decimal that goes along with the one I added one. I'm gonna raise it to the 192 power. So this should look a lot like what we're doing for the, or exactly what I did for compound interest. Right, I do that, I add, I do the power. I can even subtract the one. So I can do the entire denominator without any rounding. But from here, when I get to the division part, I'm gonna have to retype things rounded off. Okay, so for this number here, um, I'll probably just go out to the eight. I'll do, so again, keeping like four significant digits after the decimal, I'll just go out to the eight and this should be pretty close. All right, so I'm gonna type this in that we had over here, my numerator. And I'm going to divide it by what we have here. Actually, for the sake of not being too confusing here, if I use six decimals, I'll just use six decimals. I mean, is it really that hard? Probably not. All right, press enter. That's what I get from dividing here. And then your last step will be to multiply by the 150,000. And we get 511.56. Okay, so the exact answer, if I type everything in at once, is 52 cents. This is gonna give us 56, but you'll see how close that is. Um, and for this one, I took six decimals, if you wanna just say six decimals. All right, so question number four, you're looking to buy a motorcycle and determine that you can afford as much as $200 a month for a loan. Okay, so let's kind of process that little beginning part there. We're talking about making a payment of $200 a month. Okay, so it's not one of those first two formulas. This is getting into our larger formulas that we have. Uh, but you will be taking a loan, right? You're gonna be taking a loan to pay this off. So now we're more in the direction of these two. If you plan to pay the loan off in 36 months and there's an interest rate of 4%, how expensive of a motorcycle uh, can you buy? Uh, you know the payment, but we're trying to figure out how much you can buy. So let's take a look at the two, two formulas we have available. This one has you solve for the payment that you can afford. This one takes the payment that you can afford and figures out how much you can borrow. 
So that's our one. We know that we can afford $200 a month for the motorcycle. We've got the APR. We've got the, the time frame we want to pay it off. And then uh, we're going to do monthly payments for N. So that allows to calculate the, the amount that we can borrow. So we're using that formula. Again, everything is filled in and you can take a look at that and see uh, where everything goes. The calculations are basically going to look the same as what I did in number three. You're going to divide these to figure out what that looks like as a decimal rule. That should just be a bunch of repeating threes because four out of 12 is a third. So 0.04 divided by 12. Yeah, you just can get a whole bunch of threes. So maybe go out six decimal points again and that'll be fine. Uh, Everything, like I said, everything's pretty much in, uh, actually this one's a little bit easier because you can do all the calculations on the top and then you just got to divide by that fraction. So in a way it's slightly easier. Um, the only thing that's really of interest that I did want to point out here is what's happening in the exponent. You do need to be aware, because I see this overlooked a lot, you need to be aware that the exponents in the loan formula are actually negatives here. You still have an n times y, which is what we see in the savings coming from the compound interest, but they are going to be negatives here. You need to make sure that you change it to a negative, otherwise your answer is just not going to look right at the end. So please remember that there's going to be negatives there. Okay, then the other thing about this problem in particular is that the 36 is the exponent. Okay, remember the exponent is n times y, the number of payments that we make a, a year times the number of years that we have. So um, 36 months is three years, right? 36 months is three years. And then three years has 12 months in each one, which gets you back to 36 months. So it's kind of weird that it's just that number, but try and remember this as well. These exponents for any of these formulas, whether it's the saving or the compound interest or the loan formulas, these exponents represent the number of total payments or the total number of payments, probably a better way to say it. We're gonna be making 36 payments because you make one per month, okay? Uh, so try and remember that, and then of course, don't forget the, the negative that'd be in there. You can do all the calculations to verify that that is your answer. Okay, in question five, we're gonna do a comparison of two different loans, uh, or two different options that we have for loans using the same amount that we need to borrow. Uh, we're gonna be borrowing $60,000. Uh, so not quite what you think maybe the cost of a whole house is, but maybe you need to borrow a little bit where you're paying off the rest of the house. The reason I'm gonna relate it to a house is because the options are gonna do a 30-year loan and a 15-year loan, which are the typical um, times of loans for, for purchasing houses. If so if you are purchasing a house, if you opt to do a 30-year loan versus a 15-year loan, the interest rate is going to be higher. This is stuff you can Google it, um, just look up current mortgage loans, and they will every time it will pop up, it's going to show you the 30 and the 15. Those are the two. Of course, if you're buying a house, you can set your loan for whatever you want it to be, or you can pay it off faster if you want. You can do different things. But these are the two typical ones that people look at. If you're going to pay it off faster, the bank is going to give you a lower rate. That encourages you to pay it faster, which gets them back their money and their interest a little bit quicker, so they're all for that. Um, monthly payments, that means your end value is going to be 12. This is going to be a loan, so we're going to be looking at our two formulas down here. Uh, we know the overall value. Uh, we're going to be comparing the monthly payment um, of these two things. Oh, and the total payment, so we'll get to that in a minute. But we need to figure out what the monthly payment is. We know that there's a $60,000 loan. Okay, so this is the, the formula we're looking at where the $60,000 is going to be your p-value, and then we're looking for the payment. Okay, so side by side, this is what they look like. Option one with the 30 years, option two with the 15 years. You can see the interest rates that have been in there. Uh, so if you do get a question like this on the test, Remember that the interest rates will be different. Make sure you don't put the same ones that are in there. That'd be a little silly air there, but they are gonna be different interest rates. You have the same principal loan that we've got. Um, you got your negative exponents. Of course, your exponents are gonna look different though here. 
Uh, 30 multiplied by 12 is 360. 15 multiplied by 12 is 180. You will notice 180 is half of 360 because 30, uh, 15 is half of 30. That's what that is. All right. Again, I'll let you do all the calculations to kind of see how that looks. The 60,000 is sitting up here in the fraction. You can multiply it by that if you want at the beginning, or you can save the 60,000 as a final, final step at the end. Uh, you can actually just kind of move that out like you see in the other formulas. Uh, practice them though, make sure that you can calculate it and you get these answers. Okay, so the payment, the monthly payment that is for the 30 year loan is gonna be $405. Monthly payment for the 15 year loan is gonna be 530. This will be higher because you're paying this thing off twice as fast. Even though the interest rate is lower, okay, it's not gonna, just having the lower interest payment isn't gonna totally lower, like what, or having a lower interest amount is not gonna lower your payment compared to this one. Otherwise, everybody would be doing that loan. Everything would cost less. So yeah, you do have a lower rate, but your payment's gonna be higher because you are paying the sucker off twice as fast, okay? But notice that the payment is not twice as much as this one. That's not even really close to that because of all the interest that you're not having to pay by making your payments faster. Um, ends up, yeah, the comparable is not really like a one to two here. Okay, then what we do to find the total amount that's gonna be paid is you can just multiply these numbers by the number of payments that you're making, which are the exponents, right? You multiply $405.24 by 360, not negative, but just 360, gives you that number. Uh, multiply the 530 by the 180, and you can get that number. And this is really important in the understanding of like these different plans that the 30-year loan is something that's a little bit easier to do like monthly because you're not paying as much, you're paying $125 less in this particular problem. And, and then of course you can imagine what if you took out a loan for like $250,000, like the cost of um, the whole house, you know, then, um, then of course your payments are gonna be, there's gonna be even a bigger difference between them. So you're paying less per month, but because you gotta pay twice as many payments on it, you end up for $60,000 paying 145,000 total. Whereas this one, you're paying an extra 35,000 ish compared to that. So you can see the huge difference in the, uh, uh, the change there and why some people will go ahead and opt to pay more, um, each month to get it paid off faster. All right. Now I'm going to leave you with one more thing in this problem, but I'm not going to tell you what it is. I'm just going to show you two percentages here. I'm going to show you 243% that goes with this option. And I'm going to show you 159% that goes with this option. And I'm just going to tell you that you should look into that. See if you can figure out what those numbers represent. Question number six is gonna have us calculate the total return and the annual return, as they say here. A um, Little bit of information about like the concept of these questions, just in case it didn't come out as clear in class. And I want you to understand like how these are different from the other problems. In these questions, you don't actually have an APR. All the other ones, there was an APR, and you use that to figure out the change in the value of something. These are situations, in this particular one, you're investing in stocks. It's a good example. These are types of problems where a certain amount of money is invested into something. It is used to buy something, and um, after so many years, or whatever your time frame will be, you have a new value for it. Okay, and that value changed for all sorts of different reasons. Like in the stock market here, you buy stocks and they go up and they go down and you know different things happen with them. But at some point in this question, after three years, after three years, the value of all this is $8,500. Uh, let me point out real quick, you buy 200 shares for $25 each. And if you multiply that together, you get 5,000. So you purchase the stock for $5,000. After three years, it's worth $8,500. Now there isn't an APR that tells us that it's going to become that number, but we're sort of evaluating well, how much does it really change by? So total return is doing a comparison of your value now to your value beforehand. Here's how it's all set up. It should look a lot like relative change that we did earlier in the semester. 
And if you just calculate this, you're gonna get 0.7 which it would like you to move the decimal back two spots and call it 70%. And that means that what you invested in three years ago has now increased by 70%. That is your, um, like your relative change that you got from there. All right, the next question is about annual return. Okay, we know that it's increased by 70% overall, but per year, what did it sort of average out as? It's not a great use of the word, but how did it kind of average out yearly? What would the percentage look like yearly if I wanted to run maybe like a compound interest and see how this thing grows? So you'll be using a different formula. I'm not gonna talk about all the details within it, but when you calculate, you can get 19.3%. Again, you'll need to move the decimal over to, to make it say 19.3%. Uh, but that, that number represents what percentage the investment increased per year. Now, if you multiply that by three, it doesn't end up being 70 because this would be like compound interest that it's 19.3% for the first year, again, like on average for the first year, but then you've got interest on interest. Okay, so it's like you get back more than 19% the second year and then because of the part that was already added on. Anyway, if you multiply that by three, you're gonna get around like 60-ish uh, over the course of three years that exponential growth is gonna get you a little bit more on that. All right, question seven. Uh, seven, as it says here, is just trying to set you up for calculating some income tax. Uh, now the income tax problem we're gonna do is not as extravagant as some of the things that we saw in the packet. Okay, we're not gonna deal with the FICA. Um, there, there's some other things that were in there can't recall them off the top of my head, but we're not gonna do like any of the really in-depth stuff. So really stick to what problem number eight is gonna look like. Um, but some things that we need to be aware of so that we can navigate through eight. The big thing in the income tax is you gotta find out what is your taxable income. You gotta get your taxable income so you can take it to the table and then do your, um, I don't know how they call it. Oh, it's marginal tax rate. So you gotta do it. it's like a step system or a tier system. Okay, so here's some things that we need to know. Um, at the very beginning, you, you'd figure out what your gross income is, which is any money that you've brought in. That's going to be money that you got from your job, um, any interest that you made off of savings accounts, um, investments, stuff like that. Okay, so that's your gross income. So once you get your gross income, you do um, you need to change into what's called adjusted gross income, and you're going to be removing things that are typically described as being tax deferred. Okay, the main one that we saw in our work is gonna be um, retirement contributions, money that you're putting into in a retirement fund. Those, that money, you are gonna be paying taxes on it, but you're not gonna pay taxes on it until you start withdrawing it during retirement. So right now it becomes tax deferred. Okay, so anything that is being removed from your paycheck, going into a savings or retirement sort of account, that will get subtracted from your gross income which is gonna give you adjusted gross income. Okay, then after that, we're still gonna subtract more things, okay? But there are different types of stuff that, that we remove. Um, things that we're never gonna pay taxes on in the future. Okay, so, so going from adjusted gross income to the taxable income, I asked to give an example, but there's really two things that you need to know that are gonna change, uh, that are gonna change this, because you will get to claim both of these things. There's deductions and there's exemptions. Exemptions is a flat money for the table that we're using. It's $4,050. It's a flat amount for every person that's involved in these taxes. So if it's a couple that's filing together, there's two exemptions and then any number of kids that are their dependents would be a part of that. The deductions can be one of two things. It's either going to be a standardized deduction or it's going to be an itemized deduction. That's what the next question is about. How do you decide if we're using standard or itemized? Whichever one's bigger, you wanna deduct as much as you can. Now, um, itemized deductions are usually people that, this would be one example, people that might own their own business. So they have a lot of things to look at, but um, I don't know if I'm an average person or not, but just um, a typical person, I guess, I don't know. Um, I've, I've got just a basic job where I teach, I get a paycheck and that's that. So for me, um, itemizing, I don't really have much to look at in that part. I've got my mortgage rates, but um, 
at my mortgage rate, my mortgage interest, but uh, but it's never really that much that's in there. So anyway, you look at the problem to see, and we'll provide you whatever the itemized would look like. If the itemized is greater than the standard, then you take that one. And all that is on the table here. Here's your exemptions that I already mentioned. The standard deduction is gonna be $6,350 per person. We'll be doing a problem, that's why I got a box. We'll be doing a problem here that's a, a, a couple that's filing together. That number is just twice this number. That's all it is. You don't get any extra perks for uh, filing together with that one. It's just, it's the same number added. Uh, so you do a comparison and whichever one's bigger, you're gonna use that one. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at problem number eight. We have Emily and Juan who are married and filing jointly. Uh, because it says that one thing that I went ahead and did uh, from the beginning with, because you're only gonna do one problem on the test of this, so this would be fine. I went ahead and just boxed the section that I'm gonna need to look at to do all the calculations. That way I don't accidentally start taking values from some of the uh, the other columns that you may have used for different problems. Uh, let's see here. Their combined wages are 75,300. They claimed four exemptions, that would be for themselves and for two children. Uh, they contributed $3,240 to their tax refer deferred retirement plan and they had itemized deductions of $9,610. All right, for our question, we're gonna calculate like all the steps. In the past, we uh, done these as little individual parts, but we're gonna calculate everything down to the taxable income all in one spot. So um, you start with the gross income, which is any money that was, that was brought in. And for them, it's just the wages of the uh, $75,300. To get the adjusted gross income, what you would do is subtract the money that went to the retirement plan, which is the 3,240. So that subtraction is gonna get you to your adjusted gross income, but we're gonna go all the way here to the taxable income. So in addition, the next part, you get rid of exemptions and you also get rid of the deductions. They get four exemptions. Each exemption is going to be worth $4,050, which that is listed at the bottom down here. So for each person, $4,050. So that's uh, going to be a little over $16,000 for that. Right above this, there's also a standard deduction of $12,700 for a couple who's filing together. Okay, and if you go back and you look at uh, what was provided in the text here. Uh, their itemized deductions are $9,610. So that would be like mortgage interest and, and um, donations to charity and things like that. But that number is not larger than what their standard deduction is. So that's not really gonna go into any of the, the tax calculation whatsoever. That's just gonna get eliminated and they're gonna choose to use uh, the standardized deduction. Not standardized, the standard deduction. All right, with all that calculated, you will end up with $43,160. So their wages start off up here at $75,000, but once you take away all the things you're not going to need to pay taxes on, it drops down significantly. This dropped down to $43,160. Uh, to calculate the taxes that are owed, that gets us into our marginal tax bracket system here. Okay, so you wanna keep an eye on the number that they have that they're gonna to need to pay taxes on, which is the 43,000. We go down to the table, making sure that we're looking in, in this column. You don't wanna find out you're in the wrong one, so that's why I boxed it earlier. And the 43,000 is gonna fall right between these two values here. Okay, so what that means is they've made more than 18,650, but they haven't made as much, or they haven't made more than 75,900 to move them into another bracket. So they're gonna pay 10% on the first $18,650 that they had earned, then, or that they have to pay taxes on, I shouldn't say that they had earned, but of the 43,000 that they're gonna pay taxes on, the first 18,650, they're gonna pay 10% on, or of, which will end up being uh, 1865 right? But they'll do the 10% for all of that. And then the difference between that amount 
and the 43,160 is what they're gonna pay 15% on. Okay, so this is everything set up here. They made over the 18,000, so they're gonna pay the full 10% on, or they can pay 10% on all of that money. Right here is the difference of what they're gonna pay taxes on um, over what they've already paid taxes from the first bracket. So you take that difference and that's what's gonna multiply by the 15%. Uh, when all this is added up, so go ahead and just like subtract, multiply by one, uh, by 0.15 and then you add it onto that one. Once you get all that, this amount is what they're gonna owe in taxes. Okay, so they had to pay on $43,160, but they're actually gonna pay 5,541 and that would be 50 cents, of course, right there. Part C, um, how much should they be withholding from their paychecks each month in order to not owe the IRS? Okay, so that they don't have to pay the 5,541.50 cents at the end of the year. What they could do is monthly have money withheld, which is a normal practice that you've seen in your paychecks as well. So to finish that off, just take the amount that they would owe for the year, divided by 12, turns out to be 461 and 79 cents. So as long as that's what they're having withheld from their paychecks each month, at the end of the year, everything will be even. They won't owe anything. They also won't get a, a check back from the IRS, but most importantly, they don't owe anything.